and uh, wind and solar unfortunately have a negative impact on our wildlands. Uh, we can kill all the bats if we're not careful for the diesel. And we need to be able to make carbon neutral fuels for the you know, transportation engines we still choose to power with fuel. Why is LENR a particularly relevant choice? I think the other speakers will mostly cover that, but it's a solid state reaction um, that doesn't have any possibility of meltdowns or explosions. <coughs> the moment things overheat, the system stops to be being solid and it seems to not work. Now, there are other folks like Randall Mills who might have a way of doing it in a plasma. Uh, I don't know too much about that. Uh, but nevertheless, there are real good reasons to believe that the uh, reaction stops if anything goes wrong instead of continues. So, um, there are no regulatory issues. This is the big one. Fission power from the molten salt reactor is perfectly sufficient to meet all of our needs, whether it be from thorium or uranium. But we have bad regulations in the United States that don't allow an objective scientific risk assessment. And when we're losing three and a half million people a year to fossil fuel air pollution, and we're worried about nuclear waste being dangerous, that's sad and ridiculous. Um, but it's also the way policy is going. So vision is kind of a non-starter at the moment. Leadership could change that, but um, the fact that LENR does, doesn't include any materials that are controlled by the government means that when it starts to work, it'll go as fast as cell phones. And finally, it scales down to very small systems, and it can scale up to, presumably, hopefully, to power plants that run at 600 C. So if we're lucky, we'll get both the small scale and the giant scale power. Um, keeping the existing power plants in operation means that you don't have the political hurdle of trying to kill off the incumbent utility industry, <laughs> which might be hard to do. They don't like that. Uh, so every number that you want to see in a power system has been demonstrated at some point with a cold fusion experiment. The trouble is they've never been demonstrated in the same experiment at the same time. So hopefully right now, um, I know many of the teams are making good work on reliability and reproducibility materials and construction of the reactors. To make them work less like slot, like, like slot machines where they work unambiguously once in a while and you never tell when. Um, I think that there's a sociological problem with why the reaction is not well accepted. Uh, in most of science, you can do experiments, uh, report your results. If it's new and interesting, that counts as science. But that's not true in physics or economics. There you have to do a lot of calculus or you can't publish a paper. <laughs> and you're supposed to understand the mechanism of what you're doing. And furthermore, if what you're doing appears to <coughs> be dissimilar enough from other people who are supposedly experts in the area, say, of fusion, they'll just say, you're wrong, I didn't see it, and um, you know they're in the alternative facts world. And so, like with climate denial, there's many Leonard denial people, and um, you know, they'd rather go study string theory, which they can do with no facts. <laughs> uh, and uh, so we don't get the money that is available to mainstream physics. As a result. But that is starting to change. Um, yeah, I like to say uh, there are many bad reasons. And, um, there are many good, I think there's a great book on the trouble with physics called The Trouble of Physics by Lee Smolin, who's explaining how you know, equally plausible alternatives to string theory like quantum gravity don't get any funding. Uh, so it's not just cold fusion that's having trouble here. Uh, there's a premature optimization of the there are lots of great uh, published papers. There are many uh, useful books on the subject of cold fusion. These are a few that I have found interesting. I can't recommend all of them as being 100% things that I agree with. But um, And uh, there's a good trade association. We've got some representatives of the trade association here. So, uh, And the calendars on the desk are from uh, the uh, Leonard Industrial Association. So thank you for bringing those. First, I'd like to introduce Fran Panzella. And Fran is an SRI researcher who's been doing cold fusion 
from the moment, I think, that the Hobbs and Cushman announcement came out. And uh, so I will turn it over to him. And if anyone else find the just in the US. Um, and like I say, this doesn't cover everybody. Just just a small, well not a small, but probably 80%, I hope, except for the people who are operating stealth, who don't want to be known. Uh, and you see, I've broken it into five categories. The, the largest one is research, and so a lot of people are still studying the phenomenon. Uh, a couple have commercialized out, and some people may argue with me whether there was still research or commercial or, or something like that. Uh, you'll see up there in the Boston area, Nanotech and Brillouin, you'll hear about in a minute, are the two that I pulled out as commercial. Um, now, everybody has a theory, but there are a few groups that just specialize in theory and mechanism, and so those I put in red. Um, and some of them are, you know, backyard uh, physicists. Uh, you know, one of the names up there is just is a fellow who's uh, an inspector or uh, home repair civil engineer, but he has his own theory in doing uh, uh, quantum, well, pseudo quantum physics. And you'll notice up at MIT, I split it into both research and theory. Uh, Peter Engelstein's been able to get money to do some research, uh, to actually do some hands-on experiments. Anyway, I, I don't want to spend too much time here. Um, I put industrial heat in the other category. So there's some funding people, but also some of the funding people get their hands dirty, or have people in-house get their hands dirty. <laughs> And then, interestingly enough, there's uh, Tom Grimshaw down at the University of Texas, uh, LBJ School of Law, is actually very active in studying what the legal aspects are of getting Leonard into the field. Can you repeat that name, please? Uh, Grimshaw, G-R-I-M-S-H-A-W, Tom. And the red stars are the ones that I want to spend a few minutes talking about. And so uh, I'll tell you a little bit. Well, if Robert wants to talk about Brillo and I'll let him uh, <laughs> instead. But yeah, right. Um, then uh, SNI and I actually changed my talk. I couldn't find anything useful to talk about from Texas Tech. I'm going to talk about Nanner Tech and, and, and MIT just to give you a, a smattering of what's going on without spending too much time. So um, this is the latest reactor that uh, Brillouin is using. It's a hydrogen hot tube. Um, I was in cold fusion on day one when it was just palladium and platinum and heavy water and lithium. And like, by day two, there were already a hundred different approaches to the idea. And one of them was, okay, let's replace the palladium with nickel. Let's replace the heavy water with light water. Uh, let's get rid of the water completely and go to 
gas, and maybe we'll do deuterium gas or hydrogen gas, and maybe nickel, maybe palladium. Uh, plasma people said, well, let's try plasmas, and on and on, uh, essentially to a man with a hammer approach. You know, that's that's where the field went. And one of those was uh, nickel hydrogen, and that's where Brillouin has moved their latest uh, approach. And they have what they call a core, which is the reactive species, and then that's surrounded by a reactor, and then that's surrounded by a calorimeter. And, and in this field, and what I spent most of my time here, is designing, building, and running calorimeters, which is simply an engineering device that measures input power and output power, and lets you calculate, particularly in a field like this, if you have over unit more power coming out that you can't measure electrically, chemically, or mechanically. Um, over unity is a misnomer because every nuclear fission power plant is over unity simply because you're converting nuclear power into heat. Whereas what we're saying here is essentially all in Leonard is the conversion of nuclear power into heat, and we choose nuclear power by reason of elimination. You know, we've eliminated chemical, we've eliminated metallurgical, we've eliminated electrical, we've eliminated mechanical. So we said, whatever is left must be uh, nuclear. Hasn't been proven yet. Uh, and like I said, everybody has a theory, and I'm not going to talk about Robert's theory. But anyway. So nickel inside a reactor filled with hydrogen, you heat it up to a certain temperature, and you stimulate it by what Robert calls a Q-pulse. You send a very narrow pulse in very high voltage, very high power for a small percentage, thousand or a tenth of a percent or something like that. And then the concept is that you're exciting the phonons in there that interact with the absorbed hydrogen. Nickel absorbs some hydrogen, uh, even more at higher temperatures. And these operate for 300 to 600 C. And the idea is you excite it to the point where the electrons excited by these phonons can start to interact with the nucleus of the protons. Uh, protons in the nucleus of the hydrogen. The hydrogen goes in and it strips an electron away, you essentially have a bare proton that can interact with an electron and you then start forming deuterons and I, like I said, I'm not going to get into the theory, but but that's do do, do I go on to the next one. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, this is that pulse I was telling you about. They measure it. Uh, I'm not going to go into detail, but they they have a lot of good electrical engineers who've designed this and designed the measurement system and uh, you can actually calculate the amount of power you're putting into this nickel core. And then the calorimeter tells you how much you're measuring heat has been given up at that nickel core. And from that, you get what they call a coefficient of performance. You know, um, there's a lot of terminology here that I don't like. I, I'd rather use excess power. but. As you can see, under certain pulse widths, under at certain temperatures, and let me point out, at, at 600 <coughs> under, in this system, they essentially see no excess power, so 1.03, whereas closer to 300, 200, 250, 300, um, you see excess power ranging depending on the width of the pulse. And that's all I wanted to say about Brillouin. Uh, they're up in Berkeley, a third floor walk-up, uh, just off the university. It isn't meant to be a walk-up, but the elevator's been out for... Actually, they, they got it working again. Oh, they finally got the elevator working again. <laughs> anyway, but it was out for months. They were having trouble getting their argon cylinders, you know, the big D-sized cylinders, up to the third floor. Okay, uh, a little bit of what we did at SRI. Um, we we kind of have two approaches. 
we come up with some great ideas over the year and we like to try it over the years and we like to try them. And also, um, we've also started, decided a while back that we may not be the smartest people in the room and so we're happy to run verification and validation of other people's experiments. This is one of ours. Um, Michael Cooper came up with the idea uh, that if we load palladium into deuterium uh, by pretty much just a small variant in the original Fleischmann Pons method, uh, palladium cathode, platinum anode, heavy water, um, and in, but Jelani and Tripodi over at uh, INFN in, in Frascati actually um, showed that they could load thin wires very highly with a lot of hydrogen, more than one-to-one -one hydrogen or deuterium into palladium. If you kept the wire very thin, if you pretreated it by heating it, and if you added some mercury salts so that they came down on the surface to half block the surface. Um, the Hoover used to have an analogy, they call it a leaky bucket. Um, you start pouring water in and you know some of your hydrogen is coming out but if you can stop up the bottom a little bit more, you can get more of it in. And, and that, that's essentially the concept. And so that was just to make our material. Uh, and this is, you can see, loadings of, of greater than one, particularly with hydrogen, but you know, close to one uh, with deuterium. And in this field, we found if you're gonna go in the palladium deuterium system or even the palladium hydrogen system, you need to be very close to one we chose a number of greater than 0.88 hydrogen to palladium. And so we made a bunch of those, and these are 50 micron wires. I apologize that I'm facing that way. That's all right. Um, okay, the, uh, the whole idea here was, we're not gonna do typical calorimetry and measure input and output, and some of our experiments have run for two months. Um, these experiments run for a couple hundred milliseconds. So what we do is we actually take this wire after we've loaded it, and you keep putting mercury on it after you've loaded it, it actually holds in the hydrogen or deuterium. So you can take it out of your electrochemical cell, you know, wave it around a little bit, uh, but instead of doing that, we put it in another cell where we tie it between two thick electrodes, immerse it in liquid nitrogen, Re, you know, pre-calibrate this system so that we know if we put one joule in, this is how much liquid nitrogen boils off. We do that several times until we have it all calibrated between one and 10 joules. Uh, and then we put this wire in and we shoot a current pulse through it, measure the current and voltage, power, time, determining what we're putting in. Generally, we're putting in about a joule and measure from the calibrated liquid nitrogen boil off, how much heat was generated, and this is an eye chart, but the bottom line is you can see excess energy over there. You can, and, and we're trying a whole bunch of different methodologies, and we found, uh, not too surprisingly, is when we made palladium deuteride and then coated palladium deuteride by a process called co-deposition, where you bring down deuterium and palladium simultaneously on the surface of your bulk palladium, and then bring your mercury down to seal that whole structure. So you've made a coaxial structure. You then <coughs> apply your pulse, and you get your highest output, uh, highest output power. Unfortunately, this is not going to be a practical solution because those numbers on the end are joules. And so if we put in one joule, we get two joules. You know, maybe we get three joules on a good day. Uh, the idea was we were hoping we could uh, scale this extrinsically, get a thousand wires at once, and all of a sudden start talking watts and kilojoules and possibly even up to megajoules if we could also scale it intrinsically. But project ended, and that's where we ended up. 
Like I said, there's a fair amount of theory and mechanism in the field, uh, probably more overseas than there is in the, uh, the U.S. Um, I was fortunate enough to have a joint project with Peter Hagelstein, and Peter, and I'm like, Peter would kill me if he's <laughs> heard my explanation of his hypothesis. My explanation of Roberts, I can understand more or less, because I'm a chemist, so I can understand the theory Freelon zones, but Peter's a quantum physicist. Quantum electrodynamics and all that is beyond me. But anyway, um, one of his hypotheses, which essentially fits almost every proposed mechanism in the field, is at the end, you've got <coughs> two or more atoms being converted to something else, whether it's fusion. You know, if you take two deuterium atoms, and form a helium atom, maybe it's fusion or maybe it's some me exotic mechanism that we don't know. But either way, there's energy. And in the plasma reaction uh, where they do in the high energy physics, um, that generates uh, excess angular momentum and that excess angular momentum, it presents itself as a phonon called a gamma. And so the gamma energy comes out. A photon. I'm sorry. <laughs> Peter's hypothesis is all of that excess angular momentum can interact with the phonons instead of a, generating a photon. And so it generates a phonon field, excites the lattice, and that's what generates your heat. And so his hypothesis, as I explain it, and he always complains what I do, is we're going to look at that backwards. We're going to excite phonons of a foil and look to see if we can get nuclear type x-rays out. Gamma nuclear, uh, yeah, yeah, nuclear energy x-rays, just very low energy gammas. And so we devised this experiment where we're setting up uh, an excitation electrically which excites this very thin foil and, and that foil Particularly if it has mercury on it, uh, the hypothesis is that mercury is the easiest one to get a 1.5 keV X-ray. So we do that, and we try that several times. And what we we saw this in our we saw this once in our uh, X-ray spectrometer. And it actually isn't one and a half kV that we measured, so it may or may not be what we say it is. Uh, it, and we don't know if it's collimated. That's the other thing. If you form nuclear X-rays, they should all be in the same uh, same beam uh, axis. Whereas we we don't have, we didn't do the experiments to figure that out. Peter's moved on. He has some other nice experiments using RF stimulation and acoustic stimulation, uh, and I'm not going to talk about those today. One other thing, uh, and there's always somebody in the nano field, uh, Mitchell Schwartz uh, has that company called Nanotech, and he's devised these very nice little devices which you have to stuff these tiny little nanos or conia nickel deuteride particles in, um, and then he just excites them pretty much um, normally with uh, a DC uh, electrolysis. And these are the sort of results he sees. He calls it an electrical avalanche. But he finds you have to stay below the breakdown voltage of all these particles. So he finds when he gets above the breakdown voltage, he sees uh, no excess power, he sees uh, unity power, but when he stays just below it, uh, he sees this excess power. Unfortunately, he's also in small uh, species, joules or, no, no. Milliwatts. Let's say milliwatts. Yeah. Maybe 100 milliwatts, up to a lot. And that's all I wanted to say. Uh, I just wanted to get you a, a feel for how broad the field is and how uh, 
and how wide it is geographically. Um, that there are, I think there are 25 names on there, and like I said, I probably missed five or ten, not even including the uh, stealth people. So anyway, thank you. They, they had no money. Nobody could afford to come. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> I heard they were from uh, Yoshino-san, who was an organizer, that they were trying to get money to come. So it's possible. Yeah, that was the reason. Um, so LNR research. Uh, in Japan, it's known as CMNR, uh, Condensed Matter Nuclear uh, Reactions. And it's been going on since the discoveries of Hans and Fleischmann. Uh, initially, the Japanese government had devoted uh, quite a large sum of money in 1990, and Toyota had been very active for a few years, but since none of the results could be replicated readily then, um, interest waned, but there were still people in academia who were very interested in this topic, and in the last few years, uh, there's been a resurgence in interest. So you can see, especially at the university level, there's uh, 
nine, maybe <coughs> ten uh, universities now involved in London research. I think some of them just showed up in the last year. So there's recognition in the Japanese research community that this is a topic that should be um, investigated. Uh, among companies, probably the most prominent is Mitsubishi Heavy. Uh, they've been at this for over 10 years. Um, part of the motivation is more on transmutation. How do you uh, get rid of nuclear waste? Uh, you know, Fukushima was another motivating factor to get involved in this research. How do you clean up the cesium, the radioactive cesium that's been leaking into the oceans? And uh, so since then, there's been more research. Uh, they've pivoted uh, to look at more in terms of energy generation. Uh, another party which has been active in the last year is Nissan Motors. I understand that uh, they now have access to the patents that the Russians were working on. Um, their point person apparently travels a lot between Japan, France, and Russia. So. You know, a lot of the, the corporate side is probably not as uh, open, but it seems to be very active. Uh, Technova is a uh, sub-company of Toyota, and they've been uh, lobbying and actively funding uh, small research. Probably some of the university research is funded through Technova. And Clean Planet, um, who Hideki uh, Yoshino founded a few years ago, is a major partner in all of this. Um, in terms of the government, there's two main organizations, uh, NEDO and JST. Um, JST previously funded the uh, work on transmutation, how to um, make radioactive waste uh, safe. And then more recently, uh, NEDO, uh, which is under the Ministry of Economy, they've been funding work on the excess uh, heat generation. So in 2005, um, NEDO approved a, a grant, a million dollars, to Tohoku University, uh, Technova, Kyushu, and Nissan. And they were tasked with looking at the science of heat generation. Um, and on the Tohoku side, that was matched with uh, funding from Clean Planet. So that part is a, this is a government uh, funding agency. They, they fund everything from uh, integrated gas, combined turbine uh, research, a renewable smart grid. So the whole gamut of energy development. Uh, it's interesting to note that in this case, they, the, top, the uh, title of the research they funded was not called fusion, it was called uh, metal catalyzed hydrogen reactions. Uh, yeah. For obvious reasons, they wanted to avoid the word called fusion. And it's actually quite uh, been actively reported in the Nikkei, which is the largest financial newspaper in Japan. And when they refer to the work in 1989, they refer to it as announcements from Utah University. Uh, no mention of cons or flashlight. <laughs> And so as I mentioned, um, this was work carried out or headed uh, by Tohoku University and Clean Planet. And as you can see on the map here, uh, Sendai is in northeastern Japan, and it's actually quite close to the epicenter of the um, 2011 Great uh, Eastern Japan Earthquake. Uh, as you might have remembered, uh, Sendai was one of the uh, really effective regions from the tsunami. So they certainly made a very strong recovery, and Tokyo University is, in terms of uh, academics, the center of uh, London research in Japan. Um, and you know, part of the motivation is on cleanup, uh, but also on um, on excess heat generation. <coughs> the um, the founders of the research center at Tohoku, you know, one of their goals is to bring applications. Uh, from LANR uh, to commercial viability by the Tokyo Olympics. Um, so interestingly, in Japan, their motivation is also on the hydrogen society. They're one of the uh, few players who believe that the hydrogen economy is viable. Whether it will or not, there's a lot of you know, disagreement among experts, but they want to tie 
LNR development into a hydrogen energy distribution system. So this came out uh, last August. This is an article in the Nikkei, uh, and uh, uh, kind of the article is accelerating the assessment of cold fusion, uh, US patent issued a successful revival. And this is a picture of the lab at Tokyo University. So the one on the far left is Hideki Yoshino, the president of Clean Planet. And the two in the middle are Professor Ito and Iwamura, who are uh, probably the top uh, scientists in this field in Japan. And then uh, Mr. Hattori is uh, also from Clean Planet, the guy on the far right. And so this is a picture of their lab. And um, so you know they've been getting a lot of press. Um, I, I believe actually they will have another presentation to private industry next month in Tokyo. So you know from my conversations with uh, Yoshino-san, they've been approached by most of the major companies in Japan to to uh, fund this research. So there's actually several groups which are working in spells. I, I believe some of them came to ICCF very quietly, so I didn't get a chance to meet them, but it looks like on the private side, in the private sector, there's many uh, companies interested in, in looking into uh, the effects of runner. Um, so this is the book cover for uh, the Nikkei's uh, Technology Outlook 2017, and um, it just came out about two months ago, but it lists LENR as one of the 100 technologies they believe will uh, disrupt the world. You know, the others being more of the obvious, like AI, robotics, uh, smart grids. So, um, you know, among the financial community, there seems to be a recognition that LENR is uh, an important um, part of research. And in fact, if you look at the previous year's publication, which was their technology roadmap, 2016 to 25, uh, the Nikkei estimates that LANR will have a market size of $100 billion by 2025, 2026. Uh, whether we're on track or not, we, we, you know, it's hard to tell, but even by 2020, they expect the market to be a $10 billion market. And this includes um, devices from the residential scale up to the commercial, up to the utility scale, uh, as well as um, processes for decontamination of nuclear waste. And so, you know, these are the major developments uh, taking place in Japan. And I just want to touch a little bit on uh, a couple of other countries. So, as Carl mentioned, uh, right before ICCF20, there was a satellite conference in Xiamen, China, which was attended uh, by 58 people. Um, and uh, it turns out that the Chinese have actually been uh, working on this since the 1990s. Uh, Professor Nagel has written a paper in Infinite Energy describing uh, their work, and it, it talks about some of their major developments. But I, you know, I think, like Japan, in the last couple of years, there's been uh, exploding interest uh, in this field. One of the interesting things I heard was that um, a lot of the Chinese researchers, the young ones particularly, most of the communication uh, goes on WeChat. So, you know, it turns out that social networks are actually the best ways to participate and to engage in this kind of research. Um, also, that one of the scientists from the Chinese Academy of Sciences, um, you know, unfortunately, there is uh, state support, but it's very little. So, all the groups are, are academic in nature. There's, as of now, as, you know, I don't know, but there's no commercial groups in China at this moment. Um, and we can see that there's you know, wide geographic distribution of where the research is taking place. Um, so as you can see, if you look at Beijing, the capital, there's at least three groups, including the Academy of Sciences, and then, um, of course, uh, down in Xiamen University, but also in the uh, inland of uh, China. Uh, most, of univer most of them are all universities here. Okay, and then I want to touch upon Korea and India briefly. Um, so, 
there's no organized uh, effort at this moment in Korea, but they have been participation from some of the government labs. Uh, for example, the Korean Advanced Institute of Science and Technology is probably their best known um, national lab, and they've been um, having participants um, you know, for the last 10 years. I, I believe ICCF 17 was actually held in Korea, so there's you know, at least a few groups interested. Uh, Korea also has a national fusion research center. Uh, although they weren't participating in the last ICCF, uh, what I understand is they've been following the research um, ever since the beginning. And of course, the Korean Electric Company, um, which uh, is a monopoly, uh, the only electric company in Korea, and they operate several nuclear power plants, so um, their interest in LANR is, um, you know, at least they've been observing from uh, the <coughs> uh, And I think one of the big news is that uh, a Korean, unnamed Korean company has been licensing technology from real ones of last year. And finally, uh, just briefly touching upon India, um, there was initial government support in the early 90s. Uh, unfortunately, I, I think by 19, 95 or so uh, that had waned, um, but since then there's been um, exploding interest, at least in the last year. And in fact, if you look in the uh, calendar that's distributed, there's a picture of uh, you know uh, a congregation of the these researchers who are want to undertake a new effort at LNR. Uh, this is led by Professor Shurnason, who. I believe was one of the main uh, leads at the Indian Atomic Agency and he's been active since the 1990s. Uh, so that's a summary of what's going on in Asia right now. Thanks. I'd like to introduce uh, Alan Holbeier and Todd Gray here. Do you want to lead off or uh, Okay. Okay, this will be a pretty fast review. Uh, I tried to keep it concise. Uh, this is an important point. Uh, the research in Russia is pretty widespread. There are quite a few researchers, and, and uh, some of them have been at it for quite a long time. Uh, and there doesn't seem to be the same uh, heavy criticism of the field that we encounter here in the West, uh, whether that's through ignorance or, uh, <laughs> or uh, self-interest, I don't know. Uh, but it's difficult to, um, to see what the, um, the position of the scientific community is because of the language barrier. Uh, unlike most of the, uh, the West and to some extent, uh, uh, the Eastern countries, uh, English language is not the standard for scientific dialogue in Russia. It's all done in Russian. Very unusual to see a Russian paper published in English. Uh, but here, uh, give, given the tools that we have, uh, Google Translate and the services that use it as an engine for translating, uh, we can see some of what's going on. This is a quote from a recently uh, 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 recent presentation, uh, and um, uh, it illustrates that the research goes back quite a long ways. An example is uh, Andrew Sakharov's work. He was famous, given the Nobel Prize for Physics, for opposing uh, nuclear uh, weapons. This is another uh, recent development. Uh, I don't know very much of Kostirinov, but Bob pointed out his importance. Uh, he comes out of the Russian nuclear power uh, industry uh, and has started this program. Uh, you can see from the, the, uh, the terms proposed that they are in it for the long run, 15 and 30 year program of research into LENR and its application. 
Here's another paper that uh, from from a, somebody that has collaborated with us. Parkhamov uh, is a pretty well known nuclear scientist in Russia. He wrote a <coughs> book that Bob I'm about it. Uh, so this book uh, is his magnum opus. Yeah, uh, it's, it's in Russian. It's in Russian, of course. Yeah, uh, but his, his subject of study was uh, the correlation of neutrinos to uh, nuclear transmutation of elements. Yeah, so he has a graph here from 1998. Uh, yeah, based on the solar cycle. So the neutrino flux from the sun has been shown to correlate with transmutation of elements on Earth. Uh, and uh, he went on to, to study nickel hydrogen systems. Uh, here's an example of his first reactor. He put it in a, a cast iron kettle filled with water, made a fairly crude water calorimeter, phase change calorimeter. Uh, Plain fairly remarkable results, uh, gaining a cop of three or four. Uh, his later experiments uh, tended more towards uh, the figures that the rest of us in the field have been seeing, which is in the range of 1.2, 1.3. <coughs> Uh, out heat output over uh, the input to the heating system. And he summarized some of the other work going on in Russia as part of his document. This is a different kind of calorimeter. Uh, and for all of these experiments, uh, he has, uh, Parkhamov has claimed in this uh, report that the gain is uh, on the range of uh, sing low single digits. Uh, and he included in this review uh, uh, one of my experiments where he claimed a gain of about 1.5, where my final document showed about 1.2. I think, again, it's because of the language barrier. He didn't follow the discussion on our live open science blog where we discussed the error factors and the corrections to the calorimetry. Um, this is uh, another calorimeter that he's also built into his current design. The interesting thing that he's published recently is this analysis of the ash showing transmutation on a major, major level. And the analyses were done uh, by third parties, the university in Sweden and Poland. And they show similar figures, the transmutation of Lithium-7 uh, reducing and, uh, let's see, uh, 6 increasing, and especially in the nickel isotopes, the, the, ten, the, the drift toward the increase of nickel-62 and the decline of the other isotopes. And, and, and those results uh, are similar to numbers that were published uh, in the Lugano report, which was very controversial. These are the conclusions in, in Parkhamov's document, and I'm sorry that the, the bottom has been cut off. I'm not sure if I can, there we go. So this is a good summation of how the field is seen from Russia, from an insider in Russia. There's also substantial work being done in theory, and these are important papers that were just recently published, both in the past month alone, uh, and are, are definitely worth a uh, closer study by those of us that are interested in theory. Uh, the first one uh, looks at uh, the issues that I'm currently studying, which is uh, the, the morphology, the, the physical structure of the nickel that you use in your fuel uh, is a key part of getting the reaction to work. Uh, and uh, specifically, what happens when you force hydrogen into the metal lattice? That it forms cracks, it migrates along the grain boundaries, which are at a very small scale, and it makes a change in those grain boundaries and forces them open. Uh, I've been told by one uh, metallurgist that uh, there have been times when, when uh, he's seen particles shatter and grains actually popping out of the nickel and becoming separate nanoscale particles. 
Uh, so in my work, I'm exposing nickel to hydrogen at high pressures up to 300 psi at about 200 C for extended periods of days to weeks. And I'll be looking at what that does to the structure and trying to find a, a way of calibrating that process. So that's talked about in great detail in this first document, uh, showing some crystallography that uh, is going to help me in my research. The second one is um, uh, far beyond my ability to read in detail, but it, it looks to be a very competent paper by uh, uh, Dr. Radis is uh, the Energy Institute special in Samara is actually it used to be called Cosmic City or Space City. It's where the Russian space program is based, and uh, there's a lot of government uh, resources and, and funding going on there. Now, this is just the surface. This is just the stuff that can be found easily on the internet, and. I suspect there's a great deal of research going on in Russia uh, that may call it anonymous or call it secret. I think that the government is aware of this and is working hard on it and isn't telling us about it. Uh, I have no proof of that. I'd be happy to get some, some uh, uh, clues on how to find that out. Uh, just as a side note, if you look at the title of the second paper, there's this word at the end. <laughs> and I haven't been able to find a translation of that <laughs> anywhere, uh, but uh, there's another theorist in Russia named Vazupov that uh, has proposed uh, heavy charged particles, which he calls erzions. And the mass that he's found in his experiments, uh, going back 20 years and more, is virtually identical to the mass of a muon, which is also thought of as a heavy electron. It's a negatively charged particle that results from the decay of mesons. Uh, that's the subject of a lot of research done by a guy named Lee Holmley right now. And uh, I'll let Bob talk about that a little bit. That's it. Thank you, Carl. Uh, thank you for coming today. Um, just, just a segue in. Uh, I had an opportunity um, after we uh, tried to look at the thermal uh, um, assessment of the Lagana reactor. This is a reactor that Rossi made, uh, uh, or industrial heat made, and it was ran in southern Switzerland for 32 days or something. And uh, Martin Fleischmann Memorial Project. The reason I say that is because we're not afraid of using that name. <laughs> um, and essentially, uh, we assessed that um, we built the same kind of thermal assessment uh, uh, device using uh, a bolometer, and uh, we assessed that the output from that device was in the kind of order of output that we are seeing and that was reported by Brillouin when you adjusted for correct uh, emissivity of the aluminum that they used. So I went to Moscow and I met Dr. Samsenko, is the head of the physics department at Friendship University in Moscow. And uh, he is the, uh, it's the second, one of the top two uh, theoretical physical physics universities in uh, Russia. And uh, they have a forum every Thursday, uh, sorry, the last Thursday in every month for the last 20 years. And it's cold out nuclear transmutation and ball lightning. And they invite people in and there's military guys and there's all these different people from industry and so on. This is how seriously they take this in Russia. And I'm, I did my presentation, then after there was various questions from various people, and then this guy started talking to me, I thought, this guy, he really knows what he's talking about. He's answering some, asking some really sensible questions. So I didn't know what he was. He gave me his business card, and then a couple of weeks later, or about a couple of months later, Alexander Prozvanov, the guy that you just saw on the top of there, announced his 30-year program into uh, cold nuclear trans transmutation. Um, uh, with a five-year crash. So he was the head of nuclear research, so no wonder he knew what he was talking about. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so they respect Alexander Parkamov in Russia because of this book, and I, if people want me to explain uh, something about this book afterwards, uh, I'd be happy to do so. So I just want to give a very sort of an abstracted uh, overview of some of the things that are going on in Europe right now. 
Uh, one of the aims of our project is to um, help overcome the barrier, the mental barrier that's stopping people wanting to research into this field. And uh, it's very difficult, as we've all found through research, to, to prove unequivocally that we've got useful energy. And we were referring to the work that went on at the Bob Faber Atomic Research Center in, in India. And I happened to meet the director there in 2013. And he said that, uh, in, in uh, Kerala, and uh, he, he said that, oh yeah, I know about uh, uh, low energy nuclear reactions or cold fusion. It was very, very interesting, but it didn't produce very high energy output, so we, we scrubbed the program. <laughs> and that was then, and of course a lot's happened since then, and they, they've reinvigorated there. We've got an opportunity to speak there at the end of next month. So, um, so how are we going to do this? Where do I page now? It's the, the right button at the the lower right hand corner of the keyboard. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like that one. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Good. So this is uh, Francesco Piantelli. Um, some credit him with as being the father of nickel hydrogen reaction. Um, he's uh, obviously not a spring chicken. Um, however, uh, he works every day, Christmas weekends, uh, in his lab, which looks like this. Uh, and this is an undisclosed lo location uh, in Tuscany. And this device over here is the device that he, in a biological experiment where he had uh, liquid uh, helium, uh, he was cooling a nickel bar uh, that happened to be uh, supporting a, uh, a, a brain cell. He was trying to kill it to find out how brain cells, uh, when they're dying, they produce chemicals that stop them from being able to be revitalized. So he uses hydrogen to kill it, and then he puts in liquid helium and what happened, it was boiling away, there's 250 watts of cryogenic cooling, and it, and it broke the experiment, and that's how he discovered this process. So, um, he has a, a, a patent, uh, the most recent uh, iteration of it was granted on the 18th of May 2006, it's an international patent, you can go and look at it. He has his own theory, other people might object to that theory. Um, Bill Gates met uh, uh, the Italian National Agency for New Technologies, Energy, and Sustainable Economic Development. Sounds like your gig, Carl. <laughs> um, uh, and uh, he, he, this was in uh, 2014. Since then, he wrote a, his uh, annual sort of paper at the beginning of the following year saying, I predict an energy miracle in the next 15 years. <coughs> really, Bill? <Yeah>. Um, <laughs> And uh, he's lobbying for uh, longer patents on new energy technologies. Really, Bill? Um, and apparently, uh, he's, uh, he, well, he is spearheading the Breakthrough Energy Coalition to bring basically all of these big names uh, to support new energy technologies. So, um, and it is my understanding that ENEA and Texas Tech, which is why you haven't heard anything since them, in my opinion, and why someone said something along those lines, it's being supported by Bill Gates and the independent capacity. So, um, Alan mentioned uh, Lee Pomlin. He's just published an excellent paper. I really recommend you go and read it. He's, he's got many peer-reviewed papers in major publications. He operates out of Sweden. Switzerland, uh, Sweden. Um, mesons from laser-induced processes in ultra-dense hydrogen uh, from January 12, 2017. Bang up to date. Uh, there are many things you can get out of this paper, uh, and I've yet to fully absorb it, but the, it gives them one explanation for how uh, you don't see gamma rays uh, in Lenner experiments. So um, this is one of the big sort of magic things that go on in Lenner. Uh, he thinks he's found a way. He actually started out by trying to create a better target for the National Ignition Facility. <laughs> and uh, now he's able to produce very large COPs in his opinion, and uh, we, we shall see how that pans out. This is Francesco Cellani. Um, uh, he's taken a novel approach to take a wire, uh, do a heat treatment to it, and surface modify it. Uh, and he, he, having spoken to him a couple of years back about Pondland's work, he's actually using deuterium now, and he's getting much better results than he did before. Um, and uh, he thinks that Pondland might be in the right direction for at least that kind of uh, area of his, this, this uh, science. Uh, his call to fame was he discovered bacteria thriving in nuclear cooling pools, you know, so you, you have your reactor, the, the, the rods are fairly spent, you put them into a cooling pool to cool down for five years or whatever. Uh, there seems to be these bacteria uh, growing in there, and how they're growing in such high radiation environments. Uh, uh, so yeah, he actually named two species. Uh, so uh, 
he's agreed that we can go and record the entire process of his new higher output wire um, uh, production this year. So he's very open about his work, but even when you're open, sometimes you haven't got time, time to document things. And science is being lost all of the time through lack of documentation. Uh, and so we were going to spend, want to spend a week with him later in the year and video his technician who had an accident, broke his hand, and couldn't produce wires for two and a half months. <laughs> Hence, I wasn't doing this in December. You see these weak links in the system. If he goes, he can't produce the wires anymore. You know, uh, he knows it's his idea and how to produce them, but you know, it's a weak link in the system. So we want to make everyone be able to produce his wires, and he doesn't care because he's got the painting application. He's been very generous about giving people wires too. He's been incredibly generous. Yeah. A lot of people try and heat them evenly, which means they won't work, but anyway. <laughs> um, Dr. George Eagley, um, fascinating character. He was the first Soviet era scientist in 1981-1982, uh, during the Soviet period, to be invited to Brookhaven National Laboratory. And he came there to um, look at uh, the dynamics of a nuclear reactor going poof, right? Which is, you know, <laughs> of course, then Chernobyl happened. And they realized that you can do all the calculations in the world. You're not really going to work out what happens in a real accident. Um, but yeah, he, in the Soviet era, he was allowed there. And he's been doing nuclear research all of his life. And he went back to the original dusty plasma experiment um, from, from uh, Tesla from 1891 and 1892. Tesla had a problem. He couldn't make the filament light bulbs. Edison had the patent on that. So he wanted to create a competing product. He created this carbon button, or corrupt carborundum, silicon carbide button, high frequency, and it ionizes the gas. You get thermionic emission of electrons, and you create ions in there. They smash in there. They create new atoms, uh, apparently. So he saw transmutation excess heat. The, the, the carbon button light bulb presented in 1892 to the Royal Society, um, that actually produced 10 times more light than the Edison light bulb for the same input power. Okay, and you observe transmutations in 1891. <laughs> and x-rays. You wouldn't have wanted this light bulb in your house. <laughs> of course, he was using it for fun. Oh, look what I can do with these, whatever they are. I don't know what they are. Um, I mean, the, the silly thing is, the kind of, the kind of uh, loading ratios we're talking about were, were established in 1876, I think, by Thomas Graham at Boris, right, in Palladium. He, he discovered these loading ratios. So there is, Pian Tully has a library that's half the size of this room. When he said, I don't know why they, everyone thinks they're discovering anything new. Yes. He'd go over to yes. the wall and he goes, look, look, this is what they've discovered. Here, it's in 1921. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's ridiculous. There needs to be more communication and openness, the kind of thing that goes on in Russia, at least once a month. At least once a month. This is appalling that in the West, there is so much resistance that this kind of reputation trap that's going on. Anyway, so he has created a system which is microwaves, resonant chamber, then he's got a resonant acoustical chamber, and he says it creates fantastic acceleration of the particles in there. So he's taken the... Uh, the uh, uh, Tesla <laughs> uh, uh, discovery, and he's combining that with what George Osawai, a Japanese guy, came over to um, the, the US. He developed the macrobiotic diet. You can go and up and look at that. And these things are related. It's just wonderful how all the science is related. And uh, he um, basically, you get a, a carbon crucible, a carbon electrode. You get three 12 volt batteries, and you go. Zzz, zzz, zzz. And then you look at where it's done the sparking, and whoa, you get all these reaction products. So you get carbon, oxygen, and nitrogen. That's in the air, right? You've got the carbon. And you get magnesium, and copper, and sulfur, and <coughs> calcium, and iron. In fact, if you start with car carbon and hydrogen, like tar, you put bacteria in there. The bacteria do proton injection, create nitrogen. Then you have lightning and the lightning creates these reaction chains, you end up with 99.6% of all the elements in your body. <coughs> it's absolutely fascinating. 
Also has been replicated by many luminaries in the field. Um, there's companies like Quantum Rabbit, Centilli, and lots of Russians. They've all seen these reaction chains. And interestingly, I was saying to Alan, <coughs> you know, if you look at the, um, the Chinese, they were looking at lightning <coughs> with a spectro spectral system. So you can see it on uh, Wikipedia. And they were looking at what the, the spectrum is from lightning. There happened to be ball lightning come into the shop with a high-speed camera. They observed many of these reaction products in, you know, in what's coming out of the spectra in that ball lightning. And if you look at the history of ball lightning, when a ball lightning explodes and dies, you create a sulfurous smell. So essentially what he's saying is, with this reactor, we can create a transmutation in about three minutes. So this is really exciting for the project because it gives us an opportunity potentially, I mean, you might be talking rubbish, but <laughs> it gives us an opportunity potentially to do an experiment in a one hour live stream. We can show transmutation at any lab. Walk it in, whatever your analysis is, is the fuel, you take a sample, put it in, bake it for three minutes, ding, out you go, take a sample, see the transmutation. That really excites me. Hopefully we'll get things moving. <coughs> so uh, he's given us all of the diagrams for his last two generations of reactors, all of the wiring diagrams. Him and his team are willing to work with us. Um, we just need access to an SEM uh, for doing the EDX. The second uh, researcher in Europe, now Vladimir Vysotsky, coming from Ukraine, really considers he's in Europe. <laughs> um, <laughs> He does, and he wants to work more with the Europeans. He's taken the biological transmutation work. Now, biological transmutation has been known since uh, 1798 or 17, a very long time ago. Um, but uh, there was a paper in, by, published by the US Army in 1978 that concluded that it, one of these original experiments was you take um, uh, manganese 55, you put it in a, a reaction vessel with some bacteria and some glucose, and after a period of time, you end up with iron 56, okay? But of course, iron 56 is the most common element of the isotope of iron, so it's not so conclusive. So what he did in eight, 1991 is he took a syntrophic colony of yeast and, and E. coli and one other bacteria, I forget, um, did a reaction where he put it in deuterated water, and he ended up with iron 57. Now, there's not a lot of iron in natural iron. And you can test that in a nuclear magnetic resonance. So uh, he's thinking about taking this technology forward over the last several years. And he's actually got a replication going on right now. Uh, and it is finding exactly the same results as, as the replication and the original experiment, which they did in the sarcophagus of the Chernobyl reactor. Because what happened was, they, around Chernobyl, there were these pools of water. And some of the pools of water, uh, the cesium-137 gamma was going down where there wasn't evaporation, there wasn't seepage, was going down at a much faster rate. Now, I'm speaking to scientists, spoken to scientists, they say it's impossible to change the rate of decay. Of course, the Russians already know, <laughs> because it's been demonstrated by this guy, that you can change the rate of decay. So they haven't got that mental barrier. Okay. So, but what, what, what's in the environment that it may be able to change the rate of decay? Well, bacteria are there. And they've had three and a half billion years to, to have a go at trying different combinations that are all latently in their genes. So what he's doing is he puts, so actually this is the barium uh, uh, cesium-133. Mm -hmm. yeah. cesium mm -hmm. After a, a number of days, um, it, it establishes that what, what they do is back, the bacteria need calcium to divide in, in, in their system. You take calcium out of the water, but you put your cesium in there. And the bacteria is going, I'd really like to procreate because that's what you know, I'm destined to do. Yeah? But I can't, there's not really enough in here. I've got the glucose, I've got the water, I've got everything I really need, but I'm missing calcium. But I've got some cesium here. So if I punch a proton into that cesium, then I end up with an analog of cal calcium, barium. Now the experiment we want to do, I mean this, this technology allows you to produce isotopes, it allows you to remediate uh, nuclear 
uh, uh, problems, uh, particularly cesium-137 is the biggest problem when you, in Fukushima and so on. So um, uh, he's agreed to do a replication with us. It's got a big funding requirement. The bigger problem is the cesium-137. We need monoisotopic cesium-137. Yeah, good luck with that. There's, there's a couple of options. We ask him to go to Fukushima and get a cup and go, there you go. But <laughs> well, the other option is we do it sorry, in, in uh, Chernobyl, or we do it in Fukushima. So, you know, we're, we're looking at the options in order to do that. Um, but for us, the experiment that we want to do uh, with him, uh, two uh, tungsten sintered tubes, two reaction vessels, university or third party controlled uh, scintillator, arc scintillator, we rotate it every couple of hours. And after nine days, it starts going from, for 30.17 uh, years, 30 point whatever, one something years, to uh, 300 and something days, or 270 days. So you'll be able to see live on YouTube, incontrovertible evidence, which is self-testing, that you are able to, to deal with radiation problems using bacteria. Uh, Me356, it is somewhere in Eastern Europe. Um, he's a self-funded scientist. He's an incredible guy. He's really incredible guy. Um, he claims repeatable significant excess heat. Uh, he is preparing for third-party scrutiny, and we've been given top of the list priority to go and observe it. Um, his major breakthrough really came when he purchased an SEM recently. Because he could go back to this, he has a Russian approach to science, which is try it, doesn't work, try it, works, oh, try it, oh, works, try it, oh, doesn't work. <laughs> you know, and he's doing research, 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 experiment, 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 whilst running his companies. And he could see which experiments produced a little bit of coal, which didn't. And then he had all these samples, and he got his SEM, cost him 55,000 euros or whatever. He gets his SEM and he goes, oh, this one, that explains why that works. This one works, this one works. Oh, that didn't work. This didn't. You know, so he's, he's changing. And we're really looking towards doing something similar with our work because we need to understand what's going on at a structural level. And I think probably you have a wonderful opportunity here if you can get the right people involved. I did try it after this university, to be frank. <laughs> but you need to get, we need to help you get over this mental barrier that people have with this science not being worth investigating. If you can show remediation of cesium-137 very, very quickly, um, if you can show transmutation of elements very, very quickly, then I don't think you'll have a problem getting access to the facilities that we've got here at this university. <laughs> Bob, can you confirm that he's a real person? I can confirm that he is a real person. Okay. Have you yes. met him or spoken to him on the phone? I've slept on his floor. I've run so you met him. him. Excellent. Uh, okay. he, we, he actually ran 450 year old Palazzo mm. just around the corner from the center mm. where ICCF 19 was held. <laughs> uh, we ran that for a few weeks or, or for five days there, and then he ran it for a couple of whatever, uh, about a week and a half. Thank you. Two weeks or something there. Um, so yes, these are really SEMs from his real experiments. Mm. So this is nickel, and this is probably a combination of aluminium and, and, and lithium, and so on. Uh, this is some more. He said that his current reactor uh, produces these interesting structures where you get these, these nanowires uh, forming out of, he says it's the lithium, I, I think it's probably the aluminium. He hasn't got the EDX attachment to his, uh, his uh, uh, SEM, but he's saying that the, the wires grow out as the reaction goes on. Okay, there's a couple of others I want to mention. Looking for Pete Alan Smith, uh, open. He's providing reagents and, and parts for people to uh, uh, work on. Is he doing his own stuff? Though? He is doing some of his own stuff. And he's also producing videos which are very useful for people. Uh, to understand the basics, uh, in, in the, he's out of the UK. Now fire in Sweden. Uh, he is closed, but he's offered to run the, a, a test of Cincinnati research. This is where they, they say there's some condensation of hydrogen isotopes uh, when you use certain elements like antimony. Um, he, uh, he runs it out of a shipping container, 
It's a great idea, isn't it? You buy a shipping container, you put it out in the field, and you have all the cameras and the data, and you, you sit in your house going, oh, if it blows up, it's not a problem. <laughs> it's just such a simple idea. Um, and then we have a German group. They're caught in the reputation trap. They, they're they're uh, doctors and master's students. They want to work with the MFMP. Uh, we want to announce them. But uh, they're worried that the institution that they work for on their day jobs uh, will not give them a day job anymore if they talk about it. Uh, but they are replicating the German dielectric barrier discharge patent. Um, and if people need to know more about that, you can find it on the website. Uh, Anyway, so there we have it. It's just a brief overview of what's going on. In certain, there are many, many other players. Do not think this is uh, uh, the whole field in Europe. There are many players. Um, and uh, thank you. <laughs> With that, we are going to end our panel session tonight. First of all, can we please have a round of applause for our amazing? Thank you all very much for coming. We really appreciate you guys being with us to open up the kickoff for our community. I, along with my colleagues, Yap and Arjun, are really appreciate you guys. Can you take one question? Um, so actually, we're about to open the floor for networking. So you guys can have, go up and do Q&A. We'll be doing a networking dinner in a couple of minutes. In about five minutes, you guys can go out and grab your food where you guys checked in. Just um, wait a few minutes for us to finish setting up. Um, but other than that, we're going to open our network right now. Oh, I should mention we put a little library up there too, which are not for stealing, but if you want to <laughs> see if there are any books in the field, they have to understand. I wanted to make one other comment. Uh, I'll be putting the slides from my little talk up on our website, quantumheat.org. Bob, um, you can put yours up too. Yeah, and from my And so you can look at the links that uh, are I included for my papers, and maybe you can add some for the stuff that you yeah. refer to. Uh, so that if you're interested in that, follow it up at quantumheat.org. Also, we're running a live experiment over the next couple of weeks. We're going to be testing Brazilian <coughs> theory and P and Tele theory in, in one go by adding uh, 18 oxygen isotope, which we got from Russia, uh, as in the form of aluminium 18 oxygen. So we're adding nothing extra to our reactor because it's already in the structure of the reactor. And we're also adding 62 nickel <laughs> to see if that makes any uh, uh, increase in, in our CO, COP. Uh, there's a potential that there's a PN reaction that gives you a 633 uh, uh, anti-electron, what do you call them? <laughs> uh, and that, and you get a positron, that's the one. And, and you get a positron electron annihilation of the two 611 keV photons with 109 minute decay, same as you use for positron emission tomography, they use 18 oxygen. And this will allow us to uh, demonstrate whether Piantelli is correct or not, or may not tell us anything. <laughs> so as we continue the dialogue we start tonight, our community aims to link nuclear communities such as these with our and others community so we can have access to standard faster and serious research and collaboration. So if you would have to like to do a venture with Stanford Energy Club or our nuclear community, please come see me out. So thank you very much. Does anybody in this room have access to a neutron check source that we can bring our detectors to for testing? And if you do, come see me after this. Thank you.